Where I'd like to start today's khutbah is with a reminder and an important consideration. The Qur'an always asks us to reflect and to think and to ponder. And the concepts in the Qur'an, they become very difficult for us to properly analyze if we don't become think people of thought and people of reflection. That's, some, that's a demand in the Qur'an. In fact, it's even connected to our spiritual condition. You would think when you think about something deeply, it's an intellectual thing. But actually in the Qur'an, contemplating the Qur'an is also a matter of the heart. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَخْفَالُهَا Surah Muhammad, Allah says, don't they then contemplate the Qur'an, think deeply about the Qur'an, or is it the case that their hearts have locks placed on them? Today's khutbah is not about that ayah, but I want to just share a quick comment about that ayah with you. The hearts having locks already on them means many things. And one of the things that, it's me that it means is someone has already made up their mind. So if I already have an opinion, and I'm already convinced that my opinion is correct, I don't care what you have to say, I don't even care what the Qur'an says. This is what it is. That means my heart is locked up, and I am not capable now of contemplating the word of Allah, humbling that perhaps my opinion, or the conclusion I had reached previously, may be the wrong one. And that can even happen within the scope of what I thought Allah says, what I thought the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa What I thought Islam actually says, because I heard it in a khutbah, or I heard it in a speech somewhere, I watched it on YouTube, that must mean that it's correct. Or I heard it, somebody was, the, the person saying it was really screaming at the top of their lungs, I mean, that's got to be true then. So that guy's a you know, really good speaker, or they gave lots of, they quoted lots of Arabic, so that must mean it's true, so now it's become embedded in me that that's the way I'm supposed to think, right? But it's, that's just the, the lay person who doesn't really have a lot of background knowledge, and they're getting information from the, those that have more knowledge than them. But even those that have knowledge, even those that have learned the religion, and this happens not just in Islam, it happens in other religions too, that we learn religion from certain people. You don't just learn it by osmosis, you learn it from a particular school, a scholar, a madrasa, a you know, school of thought, etc. right? And you're around those people and they have a certain way of thinking. And as you grow in your thoughts, you realize some of the things I learned from my school, I don't find myself agreeing with them. I think the other school on this issue has better evidence than what I learned from my teacher. And I'm starting to diverge from the, the school that I, I originally learned from or my teacher, right? It, that doesn't mean that I reject everything I learned from my teacher, but you mean two out of 10 things I'm starting to get a little shaky on. I don't think the evidences were that strong, right? So someone who's sincere to knowledge can go back to their teacher and say, hey, these two things, I'm not as convinced. Let's, let's revisit this. Or I'm, I'm finding this, this counter evidence that's stronger. So should we re revisit this issue? But somebody else will say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Allah has chosen our school to be the ultimate, you know, ch torch, the flag bearer of the truth. Everybody else is clearly on batil. Everybody else is wrong. They need to get on board with the program. And therefore, if anybody even comes to me and says, contemplate, no, 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 hold on a second. No, I, I've, I'm already been saved, brother. You're the one that needs saving. So I don't need to think about anything. You understand that mentality? It can even happen from someone who's actually learned. One of the demand, one of the reasons the Israelites rejected the Prophet ﷺ is because they had learned what they considered the deen of Allah from their teachers. And those teachers learned it from their teachers and they were very qualified and they had, Allah calls them ahbar. Ahbar means that they're, ahbar actually comes from hibr. It means ink. And the, the scholars of the Israelites were called Ahbar because they were constantly flipping these ancient scrolls and pages and their hands would just get, you know, the ink would smudge on their fingers. So they, the tips of their fingers would always be black. And so they were called people of ink because they were constantly scrolling through these pages and pages. And of course the average, you know, believer in their community, they were not scholarly, they're not researchers, they're not, they're not spending eight, 10 hours a day studying the scripture. So these people have, you know, spent a lifetime engrossed in their studies, and now comes a prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, who is, did not graduate from any of their schools, is not a scholar by their, by their standards. In fact, he's al-ummi, unlettered, he can't read. And now he's reciting the word of Allah and criticizing the Israelites, right? And the Israelites are PhDs in their subjects, and they have an entire tradition of scholarship on top of scholarship on top of scholarship. So the first reaction is, well, how is he going to correct us? Who is he to tell us? What qualifications does he have? And even if he has some evidence that makes you go, wait, no, that makes sense. Hey, how did he know that? 
that's like very deep inside volume 80 of this scroll that you know, nobody has access to. How is he criticizing something that's buried deep within our books and commenting on it in such a way? No, 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 I'm, I'm not going to listen to this. I don't want to hear it. it. It cuts too deep. Like when, it, when you are comfortable in what you think you know, and then the truth comes and hits you, you have two choices. Either you can, I can humble myself and say, maybe I need to rethink. Maybe I need to be loyal to the truth and not loyal to my conclusions. Or you have the other option. You can say, the moment you start feeling shaky, the best defense is offense, right? So the moment you start getting your, your defenses started breaking, you get uber offensive and say, no, this person's this. I don't want to hear it. Stay away from him. Don't go to him, etc." And this is something that happened among the Israelites. Now, the Quran warns us, at le the Quran addresses at length in Surah Al-Baqarah, it talks about, Allah talks about the Israelites at length. And one thing that I want you to know about that in, this, in today's khutbah, just one thing to think about when Allah talks about Banu Israel, is Allah did not give us anything in the Qur'an that is just interesting information. All of it is fihi dhikrukum. It is talking about you. In it is your mention. Like it's relevant to me, it's relevant to you. Allah did not give us information that we could say, ah, those Israelites, they were so messed up. You know, like, that's not the point. That doesn't give you any guidance. The only purpose of talking about them in this much detail is because you and I are in potential danger of repeating their behavior. And this is it's another important thing. When Allah is talking about Banu Israel, He's not talking about one group. He's talking about a very diverse nation. Among them were very good people. Among them were people that made lots of mistakes. Allah highlights the good among them in the Qur'an. Allah hi highlights the ones that made mistakes among them in the Qur'an. Allah highlights the corrupt ones among them in the Qur'an. Allah did not say anybody who belongs to Bani Israel, here's what I have to say about them. It, it's not like that in the Allah's book. It's simply not like that. And so we have to have a careful look. When we, when we consider what Allah is talking about, first and foremost, I, cannot, I can never lose sight of the fact He's actually not just talking about someone else. He's always talking about, me. There's, there's something in me that, that needs to learn from this. You know, in uh, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, people say, I learned a lot from Yusuf alayhi salam. Yeah, that's cool. You gotta learn a lot from his brothers too. You know, everybody wants to tie it, connect themselves to the hero, because like he's the hero of his story, I'm the hero of my story, and everybody else in my story is the villain. So my, my, my cousins are all the brothers of Yusuf, and my in-laws are the brothers of Yusuf. Everybody else is the brothers of Yusuf. I'm the Yusuf guy, right? So, so what happens is we don't want to uh, you know, find connection with what seems like a dark comparison, right? But the, the reason this is mentioned, this is even in the Fatiha. In the Fatiha, we weren't just take, told to take inspiration from those that Allah has favored. Sirat al an'amta alayhim, intahal kalam. Okay, it's done. Show me the path of those you favored. That's it, okay, I just want to know about the good people and learn from their example. No. Also, uh, I'd like to make sure I don't follow the path of these two groups, which means I need to know a lot about those paths. So if accidentally I'm on that path, I'm like, oh, this is the maghdub alayhim path. I need to turn back. Oh, this is the dhalim path. I need to turn back. So Allah elaborated those paths so I can recognize where I stand. It makes me more self-aware. And that's the mindset with which we should read about the people of the past that Allah talks about in the Qur'an. Now, today's khutbah briefly, I wanted to discuss with you one of the many things that Allah criticized about the Israelites. Again, now that He's criticizing that about the Israelites, this is a potential and very real criticism of me. Possibly myself. Okay, so let's, let's listen to this a little bit. Allah says, when they come to those who have faith, meaning the Israelites, they were you know, set up in Medina, they had their, their seminary, they had their, their, their get-togethers where they were studying the Torah, and then they would come into contact with people like Umar radiallahu anhu, who used to call them out, by the way. But anyway, so they come into contact with some of the Muslims. And the Muslims start saying this about Musa, because they've learned from the Qur'an now. The Muslims have learned from the Qur'an about their prophets. So they're telling him about Musa alayhi salam, and what Yusuf alayhi salam, and they're like, they're calling them out because, for example, uh, about, about Yusuf alayhi salam, just as an example, in the Torah uh, and what they have now of the Torah, Yusuf alayhi salam saw a dream and he didn't tell his father. 
he told his brothers. He went and told his brothers. And his brothers got mad at him and beat him up. And then, he, then the brothers came and complained to their father, Yaqub. And Yaqub got angry. Why did he have to get this dream? Oh, I'm so mad. Ya yeah, yeah Allah, why him? Meaning Yaqub is angry that Yusuf got a dream. <laughs> well, the Quran comes and corrects this story. Now, it, what's the Quran doing? It's challenging the story that exists in the Torah. It's challenging it, right? So they hear it, they go, yeah, that makes sense. Some of them make the, make the mistake of saying, mm, yeah, you, that sounds reasonable. That sounds... But then when they said that, some of the other guys in the, in the school, they're like, shh, why are you giving it away, man? What are you doing? Don't talk to these people. So they'd have their own meeting after the Muslims are gone. When they meet those who have faith, they say, we have faith too. Yeah, yeah, we, we agree with that too. We accept that too. Then, when they have their private meeting, when they're alone just with each other, are you really going to talk to them about stuff? They're going to use this as an argument against you. And they're going to use this to say that you should have accepted Islam. They'll make a case in front of Allah. Do you want to convert? Is that what you want to do? You want to leave this religion? You want to get kicked out of the school? Use your head. Think. What's wrong with you? Don't interact with these Muslims. Don't listen to this. Because it'll make you change. Change is scary, man. Don't, don't change. So this, they would warn each other from confronting reality. <laughs> from confronting the truth. This was, their, this was the meetings of the knowledgeable among them. And they were, they were warning the, the mass congregation among them. So this is one scene that Allah describes. Now what might I learn from that? I might learn from that, that there are people that become, in, in this ummah, like in previous ummahs, they might become so obsessed with preserving their group, that preserving Islam is not the concern. Preserving the, the loyalty to the word of Allah is not the concern. Preserving my, my, my commitment to the truth is not the concern. Preserving that I still maintain my membership of this group, this group, talks a certain way, dresses a certain way, they act a certain way, they see the world a certain way, and my membership on this group depends on how much I look and act exactly like them. By the way, in sociological terms, that is called a cult. Right? A cult necessitates that you don't think outside of the cult. And if you are exposed to any thinking from, out, from the outside, you reject it right away. And by the way, the indoctrination in the cult means that you have to know Anyone else from the outside is a danger. Don't talk about anything with anyone on the outside. If you want the truth, we have it. We've got the copyright on it. Everybody else is a bootleg version. Don't go there. Save yourself. Right? And the moment somebody even steps a little bit out, then they get threatened. You're going to get kicked out of the club. Listen, if you want to maintain membership, you better get back in line. You better, you better sort yourself out because you're looking like you're... You're, you're out of the, you know, the, 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 the people that have the guaranteed ticket to heaven. You're... You're losing your membership. You know, your, your entry ticket is going to get invalidated. This is the mentality that Allah describes here. Right? They're scaring people to stay within conformity. That's one thing that happened. And of course, I don't criticize groups in the Muslim world and whatever. You can make up your own mind. But the reality is in Christianity, in Judaism, and in Islam, the threat is very real. That people will actually end up, their commitment, their loyalty, will end up being to a cult rather than to the truth. I've had the honor of traveling around the Muslim world and, and visiting many madaris where students are diligently st studying Islam, studying fiqh, studying sharia, studying the Quran. And sometimes I'm asked to speak to these students that have been studying for five, seven, eight years. They've been studying the Islamic sciences, etc. Right? Now what am I going to give them that they're already they're studying these ulum, they're, they're on their way to becoming scholars and of service to the ummah. And pretty much every time I have a chance to speak to them, I say, just remain, remain respectful of your teachers, but remain loyal to the truth. That's the only advice I can give you. Like you, you, you know, and and when, when the truth hits you and you say, something I learned from my teacher is not coinciding with what I see as the truth, then have a respectful conversation with your teachers. Have that conversation with, learn, keep an open mind. Broaden yourself. And the moment you start getting, hey, you're, if you ask this question again, I'm going to kick you out of the school. We don't tolerate these kinds of questions here. There's one time I was in a halaqa at a masjid, and uh, the brother spoke after uh, 
the salah he gave a short reminder and somebody from the audience said where where did you get that from he just asked a simple question like he wasn't being condescending he said where did where is that from i'd like to read it myself right and the person presenting got really upset he said my father was the grand da, 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 of this, this, this school, and I studied, and you're going to ask me where I got it from? You know? And <laughs> he, he was so offended that his credentials are being challenged because, listen, if you have the honor of getting to hear my sound waves, then you better, you know, just say thank you and walk away. Because you don't, I, I own this thing, you're just, you know, getting to hear it a little bit. This mentality is a poison that, was, that existed among the Israelites, and Allah warned us about it. Allah warned us about that. Now let's talk about the audience. So that's about the, the corrupt teacher, the cult. But there's a problem with the audience too. They're not innocent either. In the next ayah, Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ And among them are people that are ummiyun, unlettered, uneducated. But the Israelites were knowledgeable people. They were craftsmen. They were, they were blacksmiths. They were traders. They were, they were knowledgeable in many fields. And today, we can be programmers. We can be med you know, medical doctors. We can be you know, political scientists. We can be researchers. What's he, how's he saying among them are unlettered people? He's talking about in terms of their religion, in terms of the actual scripture, in terms of the word of Allah. They're completely unlettered. They have no direct access to their book. I have no clue what it says. And then, لا يعلمون, you know, so لا يعلمون الكتاب. They don't know the book. So he further explains himself saying, among them are unlettered that don't know the book. أميون لا يعلمون الكتاب. Interestingly, for those of you that are students of the Arabic language, the لا يعلمون الكتاب can be considered a sifa of أميون because أميون is nakira. And the jumla fi'liya can be considered a sifa. Now what that means in simple English is they are unlettered who don't know the book. There's a who I a lettered people who don't know the book. Okay. Illa amaniya. Except for amani. This interesting word. So they don't know the book except for amani. Now amani can be translated wishful thinking. Umniya, or originally pronounced munya, and then it became umniya. It has several meanings. One of them is what the heart desires. What the heart actually desires, what it wishes for. It also implies the meaning of the, the mind being pre preoccupied with what is or what might not even exist, meaning fantasizing in your head, dreaming in your head. Allah is commenting on the mass population of the Israelites and saying the, a huge number of them are unlettered and the only thing they know about their book is what they wish was in the book. Or their own wishes have now co corrupted their opinion of what the book... The, the Quran never says you have to pray five times. Where is it? Show me. Right? They, they don't want to pray. So now the Quran never says that. Okay, show me where in the Quran I can't go. I can't, I can't do that. Where is it? Where does it talk about beer? Show me. Where, where is weed? Show it to me. It didn't, even, it didn't even exist then, bro, so it's fine. You know? So like, you know, I'm not, I'm not gambling. I'm just tapping. That's the, where's the, where's the, is the finger tapping haram? That's just, you know, you do it in salah too. I'm doing it on the, on the screen. It's nothing. You know what that is? You've already got desires. You want to do some stuff. And now you want to impose that onto the book. And say, nah, that's not what the book says. That's what it says. Allah says, be kind, bro. Allah says he's going to forgive. Allah says it. Look, he's a ghafoor or something. What's the Arabic word? Ghafoor? Yeah, that's what he says. So you, you pick and choose, and you come up with your own Islam. And then the, even the best one, yeah, that's not the Islam I follow. <laughs> you know, I have my own connection to Allah. Oh, okay. And well, you know what that means? I, I don't need to know the book. I got my, my, my feelings are actually my religion. How I feel is my religion. And you can't judge me. No, Allah's word. No, no, no. You, that's you judging me. But the Allah says, no. I got a special connection with Allah. You don't know. Allah understands me. Really. But you don't seem to understand Allah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and they're doing nothing but making assumptions. They do nothing but make assumptions. This is a commentary on the educated yet uneducated. 
the educated and yet uneducated. So now there's two classes of people, of the Israelites, that were the cause of this great corruption. The ones in the religious class were too obsessed with preserving and growing their cult. And the ones among the masses were too obsessed with their own wishes. And every time they hear something that doesn't align with their wishes, I don't like this, this is too extreme. I like this, this, is, this makes me feel good. So I want a feel good version. I don't want a feel bad version. I don't want a version that questions anything that I'm doing. And, and what's interesting, it's, it's a really interesting opposing dynamic. Stay with me here. The, the, the population wanted to hear what they wanted to hear based on their amani, right? And the cult, so, so they want to feel good. And the cult wants to keep people in the cult by making them feel bad. So one group is obsessed with making you feel bad. If you leave, you're going to burn in hell. If you don't do this, then you're misguided. Then this, this, you know, so they're, war they're negative, constantly negative. And the people are looking for overly positive. So there's a salty poison and there's a sweet poison. Both poisons. And then the people say, oh, I don't want to follow this cult. They're too negative. I'm going to do my own thing. And then the cult says, these people are all lost. They might as well be kuffar. They're out of the fold. We're going to cut ourselves off from them. So what happens in those societies? The religious form their own social environment where they're, everybody who, similar is hanging out together, they're, they're interacting with each other, their gatherings are different, their social, socializing is different, their conversations are different, and they're more and more and more isolated from the outside world. And the outside world of the, of the believers, they're like, oh, those people are too crazy. I can't hang out with those people. I just get uncomfortable even going over to their house. It's too insane. So I'm going to do my own thing. We're going to have our own. And then our, our Islam is going to be like a wishful thinking, happy Islam. So they have the depressing Islam. We have the happy Islam. The only thing missing now is what Allah actually says. Everybody's got their own. And the only thing missing is how do we restore this situation? This is what happened to the people before us. Now, when I, when I travel, especially when I try to take observation of what's happening in the Muslim world, I notice these segmentations. You know, I'll, I'll sit with the company of ulama and tulab al-ilm and hifd students and that environment, right? And it's a completely different environment. The way they talk, the way they behave, the way they, the, what the world, you know, it's beautiful, but it's also very insulated. And then you go meet with other Muslims that are in the corporate world or in the business world or in the world of politics, it's a completely different, it's the same, they're two streets down from each other, but they live in two different universes. And the twain shall never meet. They're, they're on two different worlds. And I, then I start wondering, why am I allowed access to both clubs? Because I, I don't quite fit in either. Then I realized something. There is something that ties every believer together, and that's the word of Allah. That's actually the word of Allah. A lot of young men and women that are sitting here, some of you are married, some of you are going to be married, some of you are university students. Well, my advice to you, the reason I wanted to share this with you, is actually something that you can do that can change the way we as an ummah interact. And one commitment you can make in your life, practically make in your life, is that what you want to understand the Qur'an better. And you don't want to understand the Qur'an based on your own personal inclinations. And you don't want to understand the Qur'an in a closed-minded way either. You want to interact and deeply contemplate the word of Allah. And that pathway needs to be facilitated for the average Muslim. Every Muslim should have access to the word of Allah, access to an education that they can get even if they're full-time, even if they're a stay-at-home mom. You know, this shouldn't just be for those who leave everything behind and then they want to study Islam. That can happen for a small minority of people, but the vast majority of the Ummah also, the word of Allah didn't came, come for a few. The word of Allah came for everyone, right? So everyone, there, there needs to be a facilitating of access to the word of Allah. And the challenges before that, in the next two minutes, I'll just mention a couple of challenges. It's easy to say we should connect to the Quran better. That's an easy thing to say. What does that even mean? The first time I heard that, when I didn't know anything, I was like, okay, I'm going to understand the Quran. I've heard many khutbahs about you should better understand the Quran. I went and got, somebody gave me a, a gift of a translation of the Quran. It was the Yusuf Ali translation, may Allah reward him. And I used to read it on the subway on my way to college. Like, okay, I'm going to read the Quran. I'm going to try to understand it. I could not make heads or tails of this thing. I could not understand anything. First of all, the language was Shakespearean, which was a challenge enough, right? So, you know, when I, when the, the moment you see it, hast thou not seen it, 
you know, no, no, I, I don't know what to do with this. And then, then after that, when you start with Al-Baqarah, for example, then Allah is talking about one thing, then He's talking about the story of Adam, then He's talking about the Israelites, then He's talking about the people I don't know, and He's mentioning them briefly, and He moves on to something else, and something else, and something else. I'm like, what was this about? This, this is like, this is confusing. Now, if I go to, if I go to someone and say, the Quran's confusing, Astaghfirullah al what, what did you just say? You want to stay in the cult or what? Shut up. Just recite the Quran, make dua, okay? Just make dua. And if, you, if you start saying, hey, this, this is not making sense to me. How do you, how do you understand this? Then, yeah, brother, this is the kalam Allah. You have to have taqwa of Allah. Maybe, let me, let me take you to somebody who'll do ruqya on you and you fix your problem, you know? <laughs> like, uh, the problem is Allah Himself said, لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayati." So they contemplate His ayat. Ayatun lisa'ilin, Ayat for people who ask questions. Our religion is not like Judaism. It's not like Christianity. It's not like Hinduism. Ours is the only religion that says, think, contemplate, critique, analyze. If this was not from Allah, then bring your evidences. Evidence, exploration, go learn. Ask the people of the book. Ask the people of other religions. Who, which religion says, go talk to people of other religions? Which religion says that? <laughs> which book says that? This is an incredible deen. It's a revolution, actually. It's the, it's, the, it's the religion that's like no other religion, even in its structure. Because it, it demands from human beings to be thoughtful, to be thinking, to be analytical, to be critical. And that's what the, the base of their faith, the, the strength of their faith comes from that. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ I call to Allah with insight. You know, that's what, I, what I'm requesting that you put time into. And it, you don't need to put endless amounts of hours, 10, 15 minutes a day, that's it. Just deeply contemplate and think. And you have a community where people are educated in their religion, they're educated in deen, they've studied Qur'an. When you get those questions, bring those questions and say, hey, what is this ayah telling us? What does this ayah mean? And I started that journey, what, 23, 24 years ago? I can tell you with a, a complete degree of confidence, I know very, very little of the Qur'an. Very, very little of the Qur'an. And I'm not saying that out of some false humility. That's the reality of it. When you actually start studying the Qur'an, then you realize how much you don't know. How much you don't know. And it's, it's such a fulfilling, rewarding experience to become a student of Allah's words. Because Allah's words are an endless ocean of wisdom. There's just an endless, it just keeps fulfilling you and fulfilling you. There's, some of you are, are health conscious, you eat healthy. Some of you are exercise conscious, you take care of your bodies. Some of you have very good sleep schedules, right? There are things you put in place that make sure that you're living a healthy, you know, uh, a good life. Well, there needs to be a spiritual regimen too, a Quran regimen that needs to become a part of that, as regular as brushing your teeth. Like, this is the time that I'm going to give this to Quran and thinking about the Quran. This is the time where weekly I'm going to come back to the masjid and ask these questions to the imam or to the shaykh. Hey, uh, I was studying Quran. Here was this question I had. Here's something I'm content. What can I read about this? What can I do more about this? Start somewhere. You don't have to be a scholar from the beginning, but everybody can be a thinker. Everybody can be sincere in their, in their approach to Allah's word. And Allah does not leave any of His servants who come to His word seeking His guidance, seeking to contemplate His word. He does not leave them with misguidance. And that's the other terrible thing that's been done in many Muslim countries, especially South Asia. They tell you, hey, don't study Qur'an on your own, you'll get misguided. You have to go from a, study from a scholar. Because if, you, if you're not a scholar, don't touch it. Really? Really? The religion that spread, did it spread with scholars? When, when the Abyssinians heard the Qur'an, did they sit with a scholar when they heard the Qur'an? Did the Meccans, were, the, were the Meccans themselves scholars? When the jinns were hearing the Qur'an in Surah Al-Ahqaf, they passed by and heard ayat of Allah. Did they get a nijaza first? Did they get, hey, let me take a few courses in Usul al-Fiqh before I can hear this? They, they heard the Qur'an, they thought about it, they commented on it. Allah liked their comments so much, He put them in the Qur'an. He put that in the Qur'an. I don't dismiss the value of scholarship, but if you're going to make scholarship a gatekeeper from people thinking about the word of Allah, that is a crime against the book of Allah. That is a crime against the book of Allah. You're making sure they remain the group that belong. They don't know the book. The ummah has to know the word of Allah. The ummah has to ask questions about the word of Allah. And sometimes you will get the wrong conclusions. You will get the craziest ideas. 
And that's why you have to go to people that know better and say, hey, I had this crazy idea. And they'll say, yeah, that's crazy. Let me tell you why that's crazy. And you say, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yep, you're right. That was crazy. And that's how you refine. That's how you learn any subject, isn't it? You make mistakes. You get corrected. You make mistakes. You get, that's why you get tested. When you, make, when you get test any subject, when you have a test, the only, answers, the only answers you will never forget are the ones you got wrong. You know that? The one that got the red mark on the te from the teacher, that one cut you deep. You're never going to make that mistake again. So actually, the process of learning and maybe heading towards the wrong conclusion and then getting it corrected, that's actually the way to refine ourselves. You can't just be perfect. And the assumption that someone who knows more than you has always got the right answer, that's also wrong. Because we're all human beings and this is the word of Allah. The word of Allah is perfect. There are people that I study with, this is, I know I've taken over time, one last minute. The people I work with, they are scholars in Quranic studies. Like some of them have studied Quran, they've got PhDs from Muslim world, and Western academia, others, hadith experts, others. And we study Quran together. And when we study the Quran together, we're like, yeah, we don't know. I was wrong about this ayah. I mean, I read it, but I didn't think this, I thought this is what it meant, but that's not, that seems like that's not what it means. We're revisiting our conclusion. Just because you're qualified and you've studied it for 15, 20, 30 years, doesn't mean that you've got it down. This is the word of Allah. Human beings will ha always have to be humble to it. So I pray that we develop this humble attitude towards the, the perfect word of Allah. And that we, we develop a culture of contemplating the Quran and that culture helps keep our hearts unlocked. You know, and the other thing that we'll do, it will absolutely convince you that this can only be the word of Allah. May Allah bring the light of the Qur'an into our hearts and minds and, and allow that light to bring blessings into our, our families and our communities. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum al-ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.